Good evening. I'm Don Weinbaugh, and I'm the vice president of the Stewartstown Historical Society and a professor at the University of Maryland School of Architecture, Planning, and Preservation. And tonight I'm going to talk about James Patterson's Cheapside, a late 18th century log farmhouse in Hopewell Township, Pennsylvania. I'd like to start by making it clear that I'm not talking about this James Patterson. And in fact, I do hope that we will end up with a story about James Patterson solved when the lecture is over. So I'm going to talk about three areas. I'm going to talk about the property owners, starting with James Patterson in the 18th century, all the way up to Maynard McElwain. Uh, the, the last owner in the 20th century. I'll talk about the evolution of the house from its original log structure uh, from the 1780s or early uh, 19th century and a stone L that was added in the mid 19th century. And then finally, I'll talk just a little bit about the archeology. span uh, We were able to do some surface collection of artifacts and I'll talk about those artifacts a little bit at the end. So the first owner, James Patterson, uh, purchases the property about 1783 and owns it until his death in 1838. Patterson was a Revolutionary War veteran uh, based on his pension application from the 1830s, we know he served in New Jersey, in Bergen, New Jersey, um, from 1776 to 1777, and he re-enlisted as a first lieutenant in 1777, following the Battle of Germantown. The first parcel he purchases in York County is a 335-acre parcel, and he purchases it in 1783. So this is confirmed by the tax records from Hopewell Township, which indicates that Patterson paid his first taxes uh, to the county in 1783, uh, corresponding with the purchase of the property. In 1786, he registers a warrant. Uh, this would have been for his service in the military on 120 acres known as Cheapside. And as you can see, it was actually part of that original 335 acre tract. Uh, and here's the warrant deed uh, that, uh, that he acquired. It's dated 1786, as you'll see in the lower right corner. Um, but note that it also has a note that this extends from March of 1782. So clearly he has applied for and is in line for this property at the time he purchases that larger uh, acreage. In 1789, he adds to his land holdings, purchasing another 192 acres. 1799, purchases another 150 acres adjoining that original tract. And then in 1803, purchases 31 acres uh, that, uh, again, connects that original parcel uh, with some of his later purchases. So by this time, he's got about, a, about 700 acres uh, of land. We also, from his pension application, know that in uh, 1838, he noted that the dwelling house uh, was consumed by fire on the same farm on which he now resides in the year 1806 or 1807, and all of his papers were destroyed. So he was essentially having to uh, give um, a, a personal uh, statement that he did serve, uh, but that his actual commission papers were no longer extant so that he could apply for his pension. So this would seem to suggest that his earlier house, uh, not sure when he built it, but following his 1783 purchase was largely destroyed and then uh, either rebuilt or a new house built uh, around 1806. And in fact, if we look at the Hopewell land tax records again, in 1805, he's paying $5.36 tax on, the, on his property. In 1806, he pays nothing and in 1807, he pays just 13 cents, which again would suggest that his, 
his um, recollection that the house burnt 1806-1807 is in fact correct, and that the log house that we'll be looking at a bit later probably dates uh, to that period, to the, uh, the post-1806 period. Um, and there is some indication uh, in the framing of burning, although it is uh, it is on one end of the building and really is only on the first floor. It, it looks more like it's related to a later chimney fire uh, or fireplace fire that did not um, destroy the entire building. So it seems to be a later uh, event. James Patterson was an elder in the nearby Hopewell Presbyterian Church at Round Hill, was involved in the building of their new brick church. Uh, which you see in the in the photo uh, in the bottom, and uh, a church that then lasted until 1902 when the present church was built. Throughout the records, Patterson is listed as a farmer uh, in census records and in tax records, and it's pretty clear he's growing uh, a series uh, of uh, a constellation of grains, wheat, rye, corn, uh, throughout this period. But importantly, the tax records also show that he is distilling um, and that he is paying taxes on a number of stills uh, in the 1820s. And in fact, if we look at John Gibson's history of York County uh, from the late uh, 19th century, uh, Gibson records that a, a number of townships in York County had multiple distilleries, uh, first using rye, then using corn, but that he says from 1810 to 1840, nearly one fifth of the farmers in York County owned a copper still uh, so that they could distill their cereals into whiskey and then haul it to Baltimore for sale. This was a process of adding value to their crops uh, that's not unlike uh, later in the 19th century when farmers engage in the canning industry to add value um, to their field crops. In 1838, uh, we get the notice of James Patterson's death. His son, Edie Patterson, is one of the executors. And so Edie then takes over the property in 1838 and retains it until his death in 1879. This is, a, this is the property that Edie acquires uh, at his father's death. He then, in 1853, adds uh, another 194 acres that neatly connect the uh, earlier parcels into uh, one long string uh, of connected uh, fields. Notice also the change in the house. We now have a wing on the back and a much more symmetrical facade on the house that's showing. And again, we'll look at that when we focus in on the house. Uh, Edie then sells 150 acres to his son, James G. Patterson, who is also a farmer and a nurseryman, uh, who will then uh, own the entire property subsequently. And he sells off the northern portion of that original 335 acres uh, to Archibald Patterson, one of his relatives. Uh, and this is actually the parcel that contains Edie's public house, which will which we'll get to in just a minute. So Edie Patterson married Catherine Meads, daughter of Benedict Meads uh, in 1834. And incidentally, Benedict Meads kept a tavern uh, in Stewartstown uh, in the early, uh, in the late 18th and early, early 19th century himself. Uh, he was a farmer. Uh, Edie was a farmer according to census and tax records, but we also know that he was a tavern keeper and hotel keeper. Uh, of, a, of a hotel that he built uh, probably sometime between 1840 and 1850 uh, on, his, on his parcel. Edie, as I said, if we look at, at the 1860 agricultural census, we kind of get a sense of his farming bona fides. Uh, clearly, uh, he has uh, a, a small amount of livestock, but he's really focused on cropping uh, bushels of wheat, rye, corn, just like his father, uh, oats and buckwheat, and then other production in wool, uh, butter, 
uh, hay, etc. But like his father, Edie also was a distiller. So in the mid 1860s, Edie is paying uh, IRS excise tax uh, for licenses to distill. Uh, he pays uh, in 1865 tax on 855 gallons of distilled spirits. And he pays for uh, essentially a liquor license for hotel sales of his distilled spirits. And this would be for his public house. And here is the public house, uh, which still is extant, by the way, on the corner of the Plank Road and uh, North Barron's Road or Route 24. This is a later uh, image of that public house and hotel. Um, in 1865, there's a notice in the local paper that a harvest festival was being held at the public house of Edie Patterson. Um, it, it notes uh, uh, kind of humorously that the meeting would have been larger, but for the excess heat. And there were two Sunday school celebrations in the neighborhood uh, that clearly were not being held at the local public house. If we look at the 1860 map of, um, of York County, we see that the hotel, Edie's Hotel, is there in 1860. So we know it is present by that point, built prior to that. And we see Edie Patterson's house. This is the location of the property that we'll be talking about um, when we look at the house. The 1875 map of York County also shows, again, Edie Patterson and shows the hotel, which is actually at this point being managed by Martin Saylor. Um, so Saylor's name shows up there. And then notice up in the upper right hand corner, the JG Patterson. So that's the parcel that Edie Patterson sold to his son, who is living and running his business uh, and his farm up in that area. Well, Edie dies in 1879. James G. Patterson, his son, takes over much of the, the property, including the home parcel with the original house. And he owns it just until 1881 when he sells off that home parcel. And we'll talk about that in a minute. James G. Patterson was a farmer, like his father and grandfather, a nurseryman, and very much an entrepreneur, a local entrepreneur. We actually have a picture of James G. We don't of of either Edie or uh, the original James. But like father and like grandfather, James G. was also a distiller of spirits. Uh, again, distilling fairly large quantities in the mid um, 1860s. Again, perhaps uh, being sold to his uh, to his father for use at the tavern. Uh, but also he pays tax on a on a peddler's license, class two peddler's license, which allowed him to sell and distribute um, his uh, distilled spirits. But Edie was also an investor um, and a businessman. Uh, he was president of the Stewartstown Hedge and Wire Fence Company, which was incorporated in 1889. Don't know much about this, but he clearly is making investments in um, in local business, for sure, related to uh, farming and agriculture. Uh, he's, he and his son have a very large uh, farm and orchard uh, business ongoing. Uh, in 1897, note that the newspaper is reporting 8,000 to 10,000 quart boxes of strawberries being harvested and 3,000 to 4,000 boxes of peaches going to market. That same year, there's a there's a rather humorous uh, little piece in the paper that notes that they were complaining, uh, James G and his son were complaining of rabbits biting off the bark of some of their nursery stock. And they invited locals, uh, uh, rabbit gunners, to come and help them with that, that problem. So uh, James G Patterson and son clearly hated those rabbits. So, um, this is the parcel that James G, uh, the configuration that James G inherits. He sells off a small parcel of, uh, of his land in 1880. Um, Virginia Patterson, who is the uh, widow of, of Archibald Patterson, um, goes ahead and sells the parcel with the public house to Martin Saylor 
who by that time was, as I mentioned, was running the public house for Edie Patterson. Um, so it transfers officially to Martin Saylor in 1880. In 1879, when Edie dies, we have this notice of sale and it says, the premises have for many years been occupied for hotel purposes and are now occupied by Martin Saylor. So we get a good confirmation and he clearly bought it then at this, uh, at this auction. In 1881, James G. Patterson uh, sells the home parcel, about 150 acres, to Hugh B. Scott and his wife, Mary. Um, and that is the parcel shown here with the house sort of at the northern edge. And in fact, this is the parcel uh, that has now been subdivided and is, is the, uh, the cause of the destruction of the Patterson house. Uh, here's a, uh, a plat map from 1881 of that trans transfer of 150 acres. So Hugh B. Scott was a minister at the local Stewartstown Presbyterian Church. And from 1880 uh, to 1882, he served uh, as a pastor of the church, uh, apparently left uh, in 1882 after a fairly short uh, time in the pulpit. Um, and from 1886 on is listed in York County directories as a farmer. So he's clearly farming that 150 acres and living in the, um, the original home place of the Pattersons. And finally, in, in 1909, uh, Ida Duncan, uh, who is settling the estate of, of uh, settling the estate of Martin Saylor, sells uh, the parcel with the, with the public house to Andrew Duncan, uh, who then becomes the proprietor of the hotel starting in 1909. The final family to live on the parcel are the McElwains. Leslie McElwain purchases it from Mary Scott in 1923, the widow of Hugh Scott. Uh, and then he owns the property up to his death in 1971, at which point Maynard McElwain, his son, uh, owns it up until uh, uh, well into the 21st century. And again, this is the parcel 152 acres now uh, with the house uh, that uh, Leslie McElwain purchases. And Leslie was a farmer. Uh, and we note in this bulletin from the uh, Pennsylvania Cooperative Potato Growers uh, that uh, they had uh, a large crop uh, of, of potatoes and were farming potatoes as well as uh, layer hens uh, for eggs. Uh, but Maynard McElwain actually started running the farm, the operation of the farm in 1941 from his father, and really then maintained it throughout uh, the rest of, of his life. And here's what the farm sort of looked like in the mid 20th century, uh, a couple of aerial photographs, the main house there to the, to the left, uh, with a small smokehouse in front of it, and then the agricultural complex to the right of the access road coming into the property. Again, here's a, this is a, probably a slightly earlier picture uh, of the complex. Uh, here's a close up again, showing the agricultural buildings in the foreground, and then the, uh, the, the family's home uh, in, the, in the upper uh, right hand. Uh, in the center, the tree that you see is actually a spring uh, that clearly uh, has run uh, historically, and in fact, is still preserved as part of the environmental work uh, for the new development that uh, that uh, took out the uh, the farm. Here's just a couple of pictures from the uh, the mid century of the house, uh, the barn, one of the McElwain sons with a with a cute little dog. Uh, here's the the McElwain children in the in the backyard of the house. And here's the house uh, essentially as, uh, as it was when I started the work to document it because it was being uh, torn down. It was taken apart in pieces and salvaged and sold. Uh, here's the back wing. This is a stone L on the back of the house. So uh, we did measured drawings of the interior. This is what the house looked like at the time uh, of uh, 
that I started the project. So center, center entrance and center stair, bath on the first floor, and a kitchen and laundry in that back L on the first floor. And then as, as you might expect on the second floor, uh, largely bedrooms and a, uh, an added bath in the, in the back corner. But this is the, the house as it got stripped and we begin to, um, and we begin to get a sense of, of the structure of the log portion of the house. The white off to the left is the beginning of the stone L on the back. And based on a study of the openings in the house, uh, we're able to figure out what the original fenestration, what the original door and window configuration of the house is. And this is, uh, this is as close as we can come to that. So the stair is actually in the corner. There's a corner winder stair on the, on the left of the structure. The door is not in the center of the house. It's actually off to the side and then configuration of windows. And my guess is uh, that the front of the house looks something like this, a kind of asymmetrical configuration with a side passage. Uh, probably that side passage entered into either a hall or perhaps a hall and parlor configuration. Uh, the evidence for that is not, there, is, there was quite a bit of, of later changes that uh, obliterated what that that may have looked like, but this is the best guess given the, the location of the stair um, and the doors of the house. Uh, the second floor, we're not really sure at all. Uh, the stair comes up in the same location, probably some kind of a passage with a series of doors going into chambers or bedrooms um, during that, that period. Um, I came up with a really interesting uh, quote from 1828 that, that I think speaks to, uh, to this house and to many houses in this part of Pennsylvania, particularly Pennsylvania German houses during this period. Uh, but the author, uh, John Watson, notes in the Annals of Philadelphia that almost all their houses are of square logs, neatly framed, of two stories high. They look to the eye like Wilmington stripes, for the taste is to whitewash the smooth mortar between the logs but not the logs themselves, making the house in stripes of white and dusky wood color. And I actually found this uh, fairly recently as I was preparing for this lecture. Um, and again, when you look at the house, uh, all of this chinking, the, the mortar over the chinking is whitewashed. So you can really get a sense of this, as Watson calls it, Wilmington stripes uh, and, and a sense of what the exterior may have looked at may have looked like. So we'll talk a little bit about the framing uh, of the structure of the, the log uh, connections, and then talk a little bit about how we understand what were original openings and what were added later. So the, the log house itself is made with V notching, and V notching and dovetail notching are pretty standard for square log construction in this part of uh, Pennsylvania. So you uh, you can see that notch there and the V uh, overlapping uh, that provides uh, a really secure corner connection uh, for uh, log buildings like this. Uh, incidentally, the logs are chestnut um, on this building, which unfortunately is not, we're not able to be dendro uh, chronologically dated. Uh, you'll notice there is chinking, uh, in this case, just local stone chinking that's then daubed with, uh, with mortar to provide a, uh, a solid wall surface. The interior of the, of the structure was clearly whitewashed. The logs were clearly whitewashed. And then you can see these vertical stripes on the right-hand logs, which are ghosts of the vertical um, lath that was put on so that a later plaster finish could have been applied. And that's something that we believe happens in the middle of the 19th century that I'll talk about in just a minute. But here's a good example of how we figure out what was an original door or window or one that was added later. In this case, this was a closet door going into the closet that you see here. Um, and when you start to examine it, you'll notice this thick piece, which is actually called a butt. 
there's another one that pokes through here that you can see. And if we look really closely where this ends, it ends right here at this log. And then if we look below, there's no evidence of that buck framing going down. This would suggest that this is a later door cut in to where a window had existed. So this would have been a window. The other evidence for this is looking closely then at these openings as they get to be taken apart. So if you see here on the picture on the left, notice the small, the two holes in the end of each of the logs. So that buck, that two inch by six inch piece fits into the top and into the bottom and then is pegged into each of the logs to hold the logs stable and to provide uh, framing for the eventual window that's added there. And so only when we find these pegged, uh, these pegged bucks uh, do we know we've got a good original uh, fenestration location. Almost all the other openings have thin, probably one by, uh, maybe slightly more than that boards, which again are not pegged, they're nailed, uh, often with either cut or wire nails, so clearly later additions. And we can see this same thing happen um, here where we've got one of these bucks on the left side of the picture, the wall of the uh, uh, two logs going into that one uh, buck at the floor level. And where we're actually looking in the house is this large picture window that, that seems to have been added in the 1950s. And that's what you're seeing at the top of the image. And when we look closely again, we can see the uh, wooden um, pegs that go into the ends of, of each of these logs. And so this buck extends all the way down to the floor level. So this gives us a door location, a good door location. And this is how we know the door moved from the center of the building, uh, which does not have this kind of buck framing to, uh, to, the, um, to the side uh, in, in a side passage configuration. What else do we know about the interior? Well, uh, if we look at the ceiling joists on the first floor, um, you'll notice that there's a beaded uh, edge uh, on both sides. Now that bead indicates to us that these were originally exposed beams. Uh, you wouldn't have gone to the, to the time and effort to uh, put that uh, bead in, uh, essentially four beads on each of these, uh, and then cover it up, right? So it clearly, uh, these were exposed, uh, and then we know the interior was whitewashed. And we can then also see evidence, this is a ghost mark of the plaster so that you can see the lath and the plaster that was later applied with cut nails. Uh, again, probably in the 1850s when the house uh, was extensively uh, uh, remodeled. In this case, uh, we have evidence for the stair. It's a little hard to see, but if you look right here, notice that uh, that angular, uh, nice straight angular cut of the, of the lath. And in fact, what's happening is the lath is running right up against the underside of a stair that runs in approximately this direction. Why would you put a stair in front of the window? Well, we look closely at the window and we see that this does not have the original window framing. This is clearly a much later addition. In fact, it seems to be um, maybe even a 20th century addition uh, to the structure. If we move upstairs right above uh, what we were just looking at for evidence there, we see evidence of the, of the stairway moving up into the attic. Notice the cracking. And in fact, if we kind of draw that in, this is the stair moving up to the third floor to the attic level. And on the floor where uh, you see the, the red line that I just drew to the right or to the bottom of that line are wide floorboards that are clearly original to the house. And where the stair would have come up, it's been planked over with narrower, uh, more modern flooring. Um, 
here's uh, what it looks like when all of the, uh, the plaster is removed. So you can clearly see the stair. At the top of the stair, there are two, um, uh, two logs that, uh, or two joists actually, that frame the landing of the stair. And if you look at the bottom, uh, kind of the bottom right corner of the photo, you can see that landing as it comes up from below from the first floor. And if we look at that framing, those, those joists, uh, uh, intermediate framing, notice that it also has beading to it, which would again suggest that this stair in this location is original to that period when the interior ceiling joists were all exposed. Uh, other evidence of, of dating, uh, the rafters uh, have these bird's mouth cut uh, they're all hand hewn and they have both hand wrought nails, uh, which are uh, largely 18th century, although early 19th century for sure in this part of the country, uh, and some cut nails, which appear uh, after 1790. So again, both fitting right into this uh, dating of the building right around 1800 to 1805. So again, we have this uh, understanding of what the original configuration of the log structure looked like. What happens then? Uh, here's again that, uh, that configuration. Well, when the ownership changes in 1838, sometime between then and about 1860, we see a real extreme makeover of the property. The interior of the log section is reconfigured, the stairs moved, and we get the addition of this L, this stone L to the back of the building. Again, we get a change from an asymmetrical facade with a, a side passage to, uh, to essentially a bilaterally symmetrical uh, front facade uh, with a centered doorway and with windows uh, nicely paired and centered again. Uh, adding uh, a significant number of windows and or moving windows during that process. So here, here is the house as it, as it ends up with that, um, with that bilateral symmetry on the front. Here's that uh, extension in the back, the uh, L, the stone L, and here it is with the porch uh, on the other side. Uh, so it's definitely a service porch there. So what happens to the interior? If you, if you see the, um, the center stair shown in the, uh, in the little insert in the upper right, um, it gets moved from the bottom right to the, to the center of the house. Uh, and that stair has a newel post and balusters that clearly date uh, this construction to the 1840s to 1860s. Uh, so we have a, a, a pretty good idea of when this happens. And of course, that would be shortly after um, Edie Patterson acquires the property in 1838. Uh, here it is looking from the second floor down. Uh, we also have the interior covered with riven lath and cut nails uh, during this period, and then the whole interior plastered. So clearly uh, an attempt to bring the interior of what at this point now is an old fashioned log house um, into uh, the mid 19th century aesthetic, if you will, right? Uh, we have fireplaces, interior and fireplaces that get added uh, during this remake as well. Uh, and you can see the, the insert with the circle, that's what we're looking at. Here. And how do we know they get added later? Well, if we look behind this fireplace, the entire area is lath and plaster. So there's lath and plaster behind the brick fireplace, which indicates that the lath and plastering happened first, uh, and then this chimney was added after that. So uh, if the chimney had been there prior to the lath and plastering, um, it would be flush up against uh, the, uh, the log, right? You wouldn't need um, to have gone to that trouble. 
Also, if we look at the brick, it's a machine made brick. Uh, it's, a, it's a later uh, brick that uh, suggests a sort of mid century construction, as does the mantle that has some sort of Greek revival um, uh, notes to it, although very plain. Uh, that clearly also dates to this sort of mid-century period for that uh, happening. If we look at the edition, uh, the L edition in the back, uh, the, the uh, balusters on the porch uh, and rail are mid-19th century scroll sawn balusters. And in fact, if we look at the balusters on, the, on Edie's public house, uh, that still exists up on the corner, um, they are the exact same sawn scroll work uh, balusters on that building, which again, we know is built right about this same period. So it seems there's this uh, remake of the, of the home farmhouse at about the same time um, Edie is adding the public house up on the corner. So we get a, we get a good sense of the modification here that takes place and, and the configuration of the house post that that modification. We also uh, have a series of, of wonderful agricultural uh, buildings, the, the main barn seen here, bank barn. Uh, this is the, the hog uh, house. Uh, we get uh, some storage sheds, uh, corn crib, and importantly, we have a late 18th, early 19th century smokehouse. It's the only definitive outbuilding that seems to be left from that early period, that uh, early James Patterson or early Edie Patterson uh, period. And this is the only outbuilding that remains. It was moved off of the property by the family, the McElwain family, and has been restored. Um, the other buildings went down uh, at the same time that the house uh, was taken apart. And um, I was not able to document them at the same level that I was the house, unfortunately. Um, I do have photographic uh, evidence of both the interiors and exteriors of those buildings, but we did not do any measured drawings. But this smokehouse uh, is, is clearly an early frame, um, mortise and tenon joints, uh, that we'll see here with these uh, these uh, down braces at the uh, at the top corners. These are all hand hewn uh, beams, pegged mortise and tenon construction. So so clearly uh, one of the earlier uh, buildings on the property. There's an interior view of that, and then finally uh, there's a little bit of art. Uh, artifactual evidence that really kind of ties all this together in terms of dating. Uh, while I was not able to do any formal excavations, as the property was cleared and uh, in preparation for the subdivision that was to come, uh, I went out and surface collected whenever uh, we had a rain after they had been working and have quite a collection of several hundred artifacts that give us some, some sense of the property. Perhaps most importantly is this archaic period quartzite projectile point and, and flake. Again, not surprising given, given that early and very robust spring right near the house uh, that we would have had Native American uh, prehistoric occupation uh, of the property. Unfortunately, this is the only evidence that I found. Although the, the property owner to the north, the Manifolds, Becky, Manifold and her sister reported uh, uh, a similar uh, projectile point um, from uh, their property. So again, uh, I think confirming uh, this, this early occupation. But all the rest of the material really dates uh, to the, the sort of uh, earliest James Patterson occupation up to the present. So here's some early pieces. We've got some dark wine bottle glass. Uh, wine bottle glass, some early um, hand-blown uh, patent medicine bottles, definitely late 18th, early 19th century, 
Uh, we've got a lot of machine-made bottles, uh, again, mostly patent medicine bottles dating to the 19th and 20th century. A wonderful little bromo seltzer bottle from the Emerson Drug Company. Uh, of course, uh, in the bottom right, you're seeing the bromo seltzer tower in, uh, in Baltimore. Uh, and this dates pretty tightly to right around 1900. So again, that would have been the period uh, during which the Scott family, uh, Hugh Scott and his wife Mary would have owned the property. We've got both pearlware and whiteware that's decorated in feather edge uh, wear. Um, and, and these, depending on the wear type, pearlware or whiteware, date from, again, the late 18th century all the way up through, um, through the 19th century. We've got transfer printed wares. Uh, again, both in pearlware and in whiteware uh, that date from the early uh, early 19th century, the, probably the 1830s, uh, anywhere up to the present. So uh, from uh, the very end of the James Patterson uh, period throughout uh, the rest of the owners. Got some flow blue and flow purple. Uh, that's kind of nice, tightly dated right in the middle of the 19th century, uh, probably related to the Edie Patterson occupation of the property. Gaudy Dutch and Sprigware, uh, again, uh, dated to the mid part of the 19th century and probably Edie's occupation. Uh, various annular and banded wares uh, that, that date through the 19th uh, century. Similarly, uh, spattered ware uh, that, that uh, would have had, sometimes these have uh, pea fowl uh, uh, on, on these plates probably 1820 to 1850 uh, type of date. Yellowware, uh, we see uh, in sites in this area as, as very ubiquitous, uh, 1830s all the way up to the 1930s. Uh, pearlware, again, a fair, fair quantity of pearlware, which, uh, which suggests that, that uh, James Patterson period from, the, from uh, 1800 on, a uh, lot of whiteware, probably the largest number of vessels, teacups, plates, platters, uh, dating from the early 19th century up to the present. We do have two uh, with maker's marks, one of which can be identified, and that's a ironstone uh, china by Bishop and Stonier. Uh, and this mark dates it pretty nicely between about 1890 and 1920, again, probably during uh, the Hugh Scott uh, family ownership of the property. And a series of American gray and brown stonewares uh, and Bristol slip uh, that, that again date really throughout the entire period of occupation. These are most, mostly crocks and jars uh, that would have been storage vessels. Again, uh, here in, um, in American gray and English brown stoneware that could start with the earliest occupation and up through the 19th century. Got a lot of redware. Uh, here's a, uh, a redware, um, a redware, probably apple butter uh, crock uh, that we see in uh, this uh, wonderful Lewis Miller drawing, this, this kind of a vessel, uh, which is dated to 1809, uh, that kind of takes us right to the, the earliest period of the site but a very large collection of Pennsylvania redwares. Again, very utilitarian types of wares, uh, hollow wares uh, that could have dated anywhere from the 18th uh, to, the, to the 20th century. So I, I hope you'll agree uh, that when we put this evidence together, we've, we've uh, done something toward solving uh, the, the James Patterson uh, mystery, if you will, of the house and the development of the house. And with that, I want to thank you uh, for watching and invite comments and questions at the Historical Society's website. Uh, if you go to Stewartstown Historical Society, uh, you will find us and I'm happy to answer questions at that point. So thank you very much for your attention and for participating today, uh, and I look forward to seeing you uh, at another one of these lectures in the future.